geographically, there's no reason why Argentina could not be like the United States. Extremely fertile, extremely flat, navigable, navigable waterways. The only reason there is just Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Tomas Poyo. He is the author of the widely read Uncharted Territories blog, which, by the way, I read re religiously, and he, where he analyzes global trends in technology and politics and in economics. Uh, Tomas gained international recognition in 2020 for his data-driven analysis of the COVID-19 pandemic with his article, Coronavirus, Why You Must Act Now, which reached over 40 million views and was translated in more than 40 languages. Tomas, welcome to World of DAS. Thank you. I'm super, super excited to be here. I'm super excited as well. <laughs> now, um, you, you, you write a lot of like really interesting series. You wrote a series of like geo history in a bunch of countries. There's like, you know, you cover like Mexico, Jamaica, Hungary, Chile. Um, beyond the obvious, what are some of the major geographic factors that determine power in history? Yeah, I think people don't realize how much uh, this is the case. That's why I'm, I'm looking so much into geo history uh, because it impacts so much of. Uh, what uh, we do today and 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 where we live, uh, like for example, everybody talks about how Northern Europe, for example, was uh, is richer than Southern Europe because of uh, maybe Protestant ethics, work ethics just versus Catholic. And I don't think this is true at all. Um, and 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 you can see it in fact by geography. Uh, the Northern Europe is super flat. It's got uh, these navigable it's, rivers and stuff. That's right. That's yeah. right. It is the highest density of navigable waterways in the world, right? And why is this the case? Because you have the Alps that stop all the um, moisture that comes from the from the Atlantic, and then uh, it creates snow snowpacks, which then release this water little by little into the northern plains, and so you end up having a very um, not very intense flood. Uh, driven um, rivers, which means that you can navig uh, navigate them. Uh, and navigation is extremely important. People don't realize this. But if you uh, reduce the cost of transportation by half, you can increase the wealth of a region by 10x. Right? And, and, and the reason is because um, if you re reduce the cost by half, you can um, go twice the distance. Um, before your uh, goods are uh, not profitable anymore. Um, and that means the distance squared for the surface you can cover. Uh, and that means because there's network effects between all the nodes that you can con connect, now you can square that again for the amount of trade uh, value that can, you can produce. So transportation is extremely, extremely important. Northern Europe has perfect transportation thanks to these rivers. Also flat plains, so perfect for agriculture. And these are some of the main, main reasons why it's so rich. Whereas in the South, uh, you don't have this. You have lots of mountains. Um, uh, and, so, and so you cannot transport on rivers. You don't have flat plains, so you don't have as much agricultural uh, output. And so you can start understanding this way uh, how geography impacts all the other parts of, parts of the world. And, and it's most of it, really. And, and is, is this like you, know, you have a whole series on like Mexico. And Mexico is extremely hard to navigate internally. Um, obviously, there's like ports on the oceans and, and on the Gulf and stuff. Uh, is this why, like, kind of a theory, like why Mexico Mexico is just poorer than the U.S. is just is it, it's just basically it's just very hard to navigate internally. That's right. So, so I mentioned that Northern Europe has the highest density of navigable waterways. The U.S. has the uh, the biggest surface that's covered by navigable waterways, which is because of the Mississippi, and uh, the biggest production of agricultural uh, produce in the world, um, and also very cheap to, to transport. Um, then you compare this with Mexico, and Mexico is basically like the Rockies in the north, they extend in the south, and it's all mountains. So everything is 10 times more expensive, most notably transportation. You cannot transport stuff in Mexico. You cannot build infrastructure easily, it's extremely expensive, so you cannot transport stuff. Um, and so what happened in Mexico is the center, um, is is very fertile because even if it's on the mountains, um, it's very uh, it, it's much further south. So 
this area would be much warmer, but because of the mountains is more elevated, so the temperature is great. The temperature is great for for agriculture and living. In fact, Mexico City is fantastic for living. The, the temperature is fantastic throughout the year. Uh, the mountains also catch a lot of rain. And so you have perfect temperature, lots of rain, and Mexico, central Mexico, uh, has lots of volcanoes. Um, and, and, and as a result, for millions of years of volcanic um, activity, you end up having an extremely fertile ground. So much so that, for example, the Aztecs in Tenochtitlan, they could have seven harvests a year, seven harvests a year, right? Wow. So massive amounts of people because it's extremely fertile, but because transportation is nearly impossible, uh, you don't have any wealth, you don't have any trade. And and the U.S. is basically the opposite, right? You you have massive okay, So like of- in Mexico, Mexico City, if it, it was just like a country was just Mexico City and not anything else, that's actually a pretty impressive country. Um, it's just like the rest of Mexico makes it really hard to, to do things. That's right. Like I think 60%, 60%? Or something like this, or, or or eighty percent, or something like this, of the country, of the population is concentrated in central Mexico, like a small area of like 15 percent, right? Everything else in the north is basically desert. Everything else in the south is basically jungle, um, and so it's very, very, very concentrated. Whereas in the United States, you have plenty in the Mississippi Basin, plenty of population, and the, and then the coast, coasts, obviously, obviously, both of them with massive plains that were much easier to. Um, to 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 farm, but also much easier to uh, build railroads uh, or use navigable waterways uh, for. And people often talk about the, I mean, the U.S. as being this kind of like you know one of the more unique countries. The other country you always hear people talking about is Argentina. Yet Argentina is not necessarily like the richest country in the world. It's fairly rich, but it's not amazingly rich. Is there? Is it just like they just have been unlucky with bad governance, or what? What's the? Or or is is their geography not as conducive to some sort of like massive wealth building? If you're enjoying this podcast, please sign up for our newsletter. Go to worldofdas.com. The link is in the description below. Now back to the video. There's a reason why I haven't tackled Argentina yet. Um, and but I I already have the draft. I I know like a lot of uh, what to say about it, and the reason is because geographically there's no reason why Argentina could not be like the United States. Uh, the the um, Paraná River that goes all the way to Paraguay um, to Brazil um, is an amazing um, navigable waterway. Uh, the plains are amazing. You have all the water that comes from the Andes, right? The, 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 that's the Andes stop the winds uh, from the Atlantic, and then all the, re- the all the rain falls down, and then and then goes to uh, flows east into into Argentina. So extremely fertile, extremely flat, navigable navigable waterways, and so there's geographically no good reason weather, why. very good weather. Um, and so, and so, the only reason there is just political, right? So now, obviously, we know from other countries where there's been A/B tests, let's say, of uh, of geography, like North and South Korea or Haiti versus um, Dominican Republic, where you can have just politics being the only problem. Um, mm-hmm. So we know it, it happens, um, and, and Argentina has been uh, the case. I've been looking into this, and, and there's there's a history of. Um, inequality in, uh, that in the 19th century, um, where all of the wealth was concentrated in some um, landowners. Um, but also that actually mirrors a lot of what happened in Southern um, America, in mm-hmm. the south of the uh, United States, right? Where landowners had control because um, the temperature and the weather was perfect for cotton, right, and tobacco, whereas in the north that was not the case, and that's why you grow, uh, you grew wheat and corn. So actually people don't realize this, but I think a lot of the political differences that come, that happen between northern and southern United States come from geography, not from history. The history was a consequence of the geography. And so, and so um, this happens, and in, in, in Argentina, some of these mechanics also happened, and then in the 20th century, there was the, 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 the turnaround where then people became much more socialist, and so and so the economy was not very productive. So so there's a lot of uh, history that happened. Because if you think of Argentina, like 
in 1900, there was the saying as rich as an Argentine, like it was an incredibly rich country. They've had tons of, they have, you know, a lot of countries, they've benefited a lot from immigration. They have all these very, very smart people that have immigrated there. Um, and, you know, and ma- many have come from, from, um, from Italy and from many, many other countries in Germany um, and stuff to Argentina. They've had, they've had a lot, you just, you just like literally list down the things like they've, they've benefited from almost every major trend. They have lots, they basically can make everything they want there. Um, they're self-sufficient yet still, it's just like, they just still have just bad after bad after bad governance. That, that, that's right. And it's good that you say this because in the United States, one of the biggest sources of strength has comes from has come from the immigration that came in the 19th century. You can see the GDP per capita was growing. It was growing at similar levels as Europe, but it's the population that was exploding, right? Yeah. So Argentina had something similar. But back to politics, right? Uh, in the United States, you had things like the Homestead Act, where the people were incentivized to come and produce their own stuff because they were given uh, land to do it. But you didn't have this in Argentina. And so you have a smaller incentive to come and produce, mm. much more concentration of, of, of wealth. Uh, and so that was much less conducive to, to, to generating this wealth. What are, what are some, do you think these factors are, are you know, you just, the thing of things like rivers, like, are, are they still going to be super important in the future? Um, are they going to become less important? Um, wh- what geographic factors do you think might supplant the the ones that have been so determinant over you know the last few hundred years. One of the reasons why I love uh, studying these geohistory is to really understand what um, produced the past, because I believe these things are changing in the future. And if and if you don't understand really like how you came to be where you are today, you cannot predict what's going to happen next. Right? And so and so uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples. Um, Desalination, for example, uh, costs are going down dramatically, and just because energy of, costs are going down, uh, the, the, because of the technology has been going down, and yeah. like, energy costs haven't quite yet. They have a little bit, but not quite yet. Like, but they are about to go go down even further. Yeah, and so suddenly you are uh, you, you are untying location from fresh water. Yeah. That's huge. That's, that's huge. massive. Yeah, uh, that's massive. Um, and th- then you, you can have examples like du- Dubai or Singapore, uh, right? So Singapore has a big advantage based on the location, but uh, Malaysia is close to it and doesn't have this amount of wealth, right? So it's it's, it's Singapore that was well managed and it was kind of swampy, um, so it was not like the perfect situation. It was good for a port. But that's kind of that kind of it, and so and so the entire little bit from geography, you have countries like Switzerland that haven't a perfect geography and are quite uh, rich. You have Dubai, very very bad geography, didn't have oil to to um, to to make it uh, grow, and yet they were able to create this amazing city. And so and so you are seeing these things untying from geography, and and we're seeing on a day to day basis where you have. And what most of the wealth now is generated by tech, by, by, by the internet, by data centers, and those things can really be anywhere. And so regulation and governments now matter much more to, to the management uh, and, and then wealth generation than geography. And is, is the price of energy also something you'll see? I mean, in, you'll see in certain countries where the price of energy will fall faster than in others. Um, energy will be easier to move in certain countries. Is that going to be something that's going to uh, lead to more rise in certain countries and maybe not in others? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, I think so. So it's interesting to look at what were the drivers of, of, of energy costs in the last few decades, right? And, and, and there's this Adams curve where we see the consumption of energy going going up and up and up. Um, and this is like 1800s, right. like, yeah exponential yeah. until like the, the 1970s right and then it's, it flattens out and and the question is is why right and and, and uh, there, there's two pressures um there one of them was on the supply side we know the the oil um uh, crisis of of the 70s the opec um limiting supply to to increase prices and then you also have um, climate change uh, and things like that where there's pressure to to consume less on the demand side um but now these are going to be released 
and um, and that's because solar energy, mostly solar energy, wind too, but mostly solar energy, are going to probably drop the costs of electricity down by 10x, close to this in the next decade or so. They're and we're already, already seeing that one. happening in, in many, right. many places. Yeah. That's right. They're already, already the cheapest. Wind, uh, onshore wind and solar are already the cheapest sources of, of, of electricity. And so, and so this is going to, and, and the good thing about solar and, and wind is that they're basically everywhere. Like Finland, which is one of the countries that are the furthest, farthest no, north, only has four times less sun on the, in the equator, right? So, uh, and and we so it only takes five, five, six, eight, seven years of solar improvement for them to have the same productivity as in the equator, right? So every country now is going to have cheap electricity. Um, and that means that we can produce much more. And it also means that all the countries that today control and energy, which means oil, are going to lose substantial amounts of, of the power. And and one of the things about solar and wind is they're a little bit more intermittent. Um, you could see a scenario where, um, think like you mentioned, desalination. Um, you could potentially like turn on the plant like when energy is super cheap and turn it off. Like so, if it's super cheap at one p.m., you 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 turn it on. And when if it's super expensive at midnight, you turn it off or, or, or something like that, right? And so you could see these scenarios where where you start to organize the economy around the price of energy throughout the day. That that's so fascinating. Like this, and there's so many things to say here. So cut me because like like there's like five branches that come from here. So so the first one is to understand that solar and wind are actually extremely compatible, and the reason is because um, when there's no sun. Wind patterns are pretty stable um, because they're linked to the movement of the Earth. Right, the, the, the Earth turns around and the atmosphere follows it, um, and this movement is what causes the winds. And the um, and the the aeolic uh, towers capture this. When there's sun, the sun hits the ground, and so that means that the wind, like the air, goes up, and it interferes with the wind that is going transversely, which means that when there's sun in summer or during the day, there's less wind. Um, and so when you're generating uh, electricity from solar panels, you're not generating from wind but when you, and vice versa, right? So they're actually quite complementary, both oh, night and day and summer and, and wind. So we should so just put turbines on the top of solar panels or something. <laughs> you know. Right. So so that's one, one of the things. Like the second thing is... Um, Today, we cannot install batteries because they're expensive, but the cost um, is, going, is going down faster than the cost of solar. Right? And so I haven't calculated yet when we're going to get into places where, where we can easily use uh, batteries, but my guess is it's going to come as a matter of how many years. The, the the third thing is in and by the way you can always just like roll a boulder up the hill when the energy is is negative and then just roll it down right that's that's a that's an old school battery you're right, right. Yeah. I think what you what you're saying is you can store energy in many different ways and batteries yeah. is one there's so many I think like the, the obvious one is is water right water reservoirs yeah you, like you can pump water back up and down what you're saying is another one another one is is heat you can actually um you can you can uh, put it uh, heat into bricks or into rock, and then extract it. And actually, the, the the going back and forth into that actually doesn't lose that much energy. So there's a bunch of ways we can do it. And my, my I'm I'm sure we're going to crack this. Yeah. But this question is what of what do we do in the meantime? So so in until then, what's going to happen is that you have small pieces of land that are going to be where electricity is going to be extremely cheap for some hour, uh, like hours of the day and the rest of the economy where that's not going to be the case, right? So like co-located with solar um, farms, that's going to be extremely cheap electricity during the day, but storing it for the night or connecting these to the, to the grid is like, these are expensive and hard. Um, so we might not do this for some time. So then what happens to the economy to use this as an arbitrage opportunity? If you have electricity that's cheap in some places at some times and expensive otherwise, that's an arbitrary opportunity. And, and I think uh, the answer is there's going to be a lot of uh, new industries that spring up to take advantage of this arbitrage opportunity. 
Yeah, because you can imagine uh, if you're like, you know, training an AI model, well, you don't have to run that 24 hours a day. You could run that for four hours a day um, when energy is, is the price of energy is zero um, or negative and then and then just turn it off for a while and then run, you know, so, you know, yeah, maybe it takes a little bit longer to train the model, but it's much, much cheaper. So that's a, that's a fundamental, like that's a, such, a, such an interesting uh, um, comment because uh, the, the fundamental force behind this is um, what are things where the cost of electricity matters a lot, but the capex does not. And so here you give me an example of the data data um, uh, uh, where data centers where the cost of the capex is high today. Yeah. Right? So so Nvidia is making all the money in yes. AI, and so and so the question I think is like if you think a bit about it from this perspective, then the question becomes is what are the industries that have high opex cost from energy and can have low capex? And I'll give you a couple of them. Um, one of them is natural gas, right? So natural gas today, you extract it from the ground, but you could uh, generate it from the air. You can capture CO2 from the air, you can get water, you split the water, you create hydrogen with this, and you mix the hydrogen with the CO2, and basically you get methane, right? Mm -hmm. Methane is natural gas. The only reason why you don't do this is because energy is very expensive. And because it's very expensive, the result is that we are, um, hold on, because I had a, a notification. And the reason, um, so what was I saying? What was I saying? The reason why energy is expensive, uh, oh, or yeah. the reason why. So the energy is very, yeah. So the energy is very expensive. And then as a result, um, the, the, the companies that generate hydrogen, for example, uh, focus on optimizing the cost of capex. Um, uh, sorry, on optimizing the cost of opex, and so they end up having machines that are very expensive. If your energy now becomes dirt cheap, you can produce um, machines that are dirt cheap too, because you're not yeah. optimizing for the energy. And so what you end up having, and this is true today, you already have machines that can generate CO two, um, sorry, uh, methane from thin air in the United States more cheaply than pulling it from the ground, right? And this is only going to be more true in the next few years. Today, this is true because of, of, of uh, help from subsidies from the government, but in a few years, it's just gonna be straight cheaper to pull your, your methane from the air than from the ground. Yeah, so like last year in 2023, California had negative energy prices for 20% of the hours. I assume in 2024, it'll be even higher than 20%. You know, at some point, you could just see this like crazy curve. It could be like 40% at some point where it's like literally the price is negative. Like they're paying you to actually use the energy. So, so that's right. And people think, oh, because now the energy is negative, the cost of energy is negative during the day, people are going to stop installing uh, solar panels. But that's not true for a couple of reasons. One of them is the valuable energy now happens in the morning at night, right? That's mm -hmm. where, uh, and, and, so, and so what happens is you have this, imagine that you have this curve of sun uh, electricity um, during the day. And so you are going to install more solar panels because your curve now grows like this. And so these sides here on the morning and the evening are extremely valuable electricity. Here at the top, you throw this energy away because that's like, nobody's gonna buy it, but they're gonna buy it on the sides. So in the morning, in the evening, because you have more um, solar energy. And so what happens is you are going to have more energy that is basically free or even people pay you to consume it in the middle of the day. And so you can use that. One of them is, as I mentioned, methane production for sure. Yeah. So imagine, Im imagine the geopolitical re repercussions of this. Any country can produce their methane for free. And so the second, uh, a second example to me is, is uh, farming. So farming... Uh, 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 one of the reasons like farming is, is a lot of energy, really, right? Yeah. Uh, fertilizer is fertilizer. energy. Fertilizer, yep. That's right. You Like lights, you want to put lights during yeah. at night, for example. Right, vertical like farming, right. Vertical farming. Vertical farming is like 30, 40% of the costs are energy uh, today, and that makes it impossible. But if you divide these costs by 10, suddenly you can create vertical farming. And if you can do vertical farming, 
then the entire earth changes because around yeah. 15 ish percent of the entire habitable land is um, is farming and all of that can be replaced uh, with wood or whatever we want because now suddenly we can produce um, uh, food from in vertical farms not only that but also geopolitically the consequences of that any country now can be independent in their food production right so how is the world going to react to this that's super in- i find it super interesting too because if you just think of like the average consumer let's say your electric bill is x hundred dollars a month or something like that your energy bill six hundred dollars a month for your average consumer well if you're a consumer you're you're a lot of your bills a lot of your appliances are 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 just kind of going at random times per day and stuff if there are certain parts of the day where it's negative you don't even have to be home but you could like run your washing machine and run your dryer when you're not home you could run your dishwasher in a home you could charge your car um you know at certain points in the time you, there's all these other things that you could do um and most of those most of the energy uses for people are actually very, very spiky. It's just that it's the dishwasher, it's the dryer, right. it's the, right. you know, it's the, it's not the refrigerator, which is always going on yeah. and stuff. And then of course you can always have like a big battery pack in your house too. And That's so right. you can just like charge that when the energy price is close to, is close to zero. So we're, we could start to see this like inter- interesting thing where it could like all of a sudden it could be this like deflationary thing for consumers where they have more money in their pockets because they're spending less money on things like on on things like energy. I think that's the, I think that's probably going to be the case, and but I, and I wonder and I haven't looked into this, but but I'm wondering if if the biggest impact is going to be on this side on the or the industry side because uh, my guess is for many people electricity is a substantial part of their. Or energy is of their costs, but but it's not going to be in countries like the United States. It's not going to be like fifty percent, right? Um, yeah, good this point. is very different in like in, in regions like Africa, right? In Africa, uh, you don't have a grid. Energy is extremely expensive, um, and so suddenly, if you can have free electricity, reliable all the time, how does it change the entire economy? So there, on the consumer side, it's more in countries like. Pakistan or Malawi uh, in Africa, like, or like places like this that don't have a reliable um, grid um, and energy is very expensive as a share of cons- uh, consumer spending, that is going to be dramatic. I think in countries uh, like the U- United States, where the cost of energy is a small percentage of people's um, uh, costs, overall cost on average, I think the, the, the biggest impact is going to be hidden because it's through the industry, right? So what happens if natural gas is free? Uh, uh, and so, so I think th- those are the, 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 what happens is your food, if your food suddenly, instead of costing you seven to 15% of your costs, now it costs you like two or 3% because- Yeah, because food, food, food prices are so energy dependent. Huge, huge, like it's energy. We're taking Haberbosch to create fertilizer. We're like the, yeah. the, the lines we're talking about. And of course they have to transport it, which is also very energy- Dependent as well. It is. I think yeah. so. So if I, if I'm not wrong, like transportation is around seven seven ish percent of the cost of of uh, of food. Um, so I, I so I think it matters, uh, but it matters less than some of these things. But 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 here's an example. So something that I found that's it's crazy. Um, the the productivity of tomatoes in the Netherlands per acre, I think is something like twenty or forty times higher than in other countries even developed countries like yeah, why why is the netherlands like everyone always points to the netherlands <laughs> as being this like agricultural place like why have they figured it out and yeah. it seems like nowhere else in the world has like even anywhere near the productivity that they do so i i i, I i'm like 70 percent confidence on what i'm going to tell you okay. but uh, uh the the so 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 yeah grain of salt uh, they discovered natural gas in the 70s yeah and the, the dutch uh, disease yeah <laughs> that's disease. Um, but uh, thankfully, their disease is weaker than in other countries. And so one of the ways that they use this is to power um, their their uh, greenhouses. So uh, the if you if you take pictures of uh, the Netherlands, some parts of the Netherlands at night, you see that they're they're purple. Um, and why are they purple? Because they're lighting the greenhouses, and purple is the most efficient color for for um, plants. And so they have their 
um, there are greenhouses where the temperature is optimized, the CO2 is optimized, uh, the fertilizer is optimized, like everything right. is you, optimized. You're always going to have a perfect harvest. That's right. And you can do that because energy was cheap, because mm. they had natural gas. Um, and so and so now apply this to everywhere else in the world, and suddenly you can like 10x, 50x your, your productivity. Interesting. Uh, now, you know, another person who really writes a lot about geography is Peter Zihan. How do how do your views differ from his? I I, I love uh, what he's done. I think um, part of why I started writing and uh, studying what I do is because of the work that he did um, when he was at Stratfor, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, like the, there was a series of monographs that I read. I don't know, like ten years ago, maybe or something like this. Like fantastic, fantastic monographs of countries, and um, these plus things like uh, guns, gems, and steel got me into 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 these uh, these geography. So so I don't think. Um, that I am fundamentally different from him. I think we're focusing our attention in different places. Uh, he decided to use his insights to understand current present-day geopolitics, right? Uh, what's what's going to happen in Lebanon tomorrow? Yeah. Right? And 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 I think uh, I'm less interested in that. I'm more interested in the big arrow of history. Um, and so, and so, not what's going to happen tomorrow in Lebanon, but what's going to happen in the Middle East in the next twenty years when Saudi Arabia does not have the oil money that it does anymore, right? So these are the questions I think that that I'm a bit more focused on. But 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 he's amazing, and I love what he's written, and 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 I think we we think alike in ge geographical determinism. And if you think of like you know, we, we you you write a lot about oil and um, oil money and stuff, and people have been somewhat predicting. Um, oil money will go down for some of these big oil producing countries for many years. Um, when do you think like that actually catches up? And it does seem like many of them are planning. It seems like folks like Saudi Arabia and many of these other ones are planning for this inevitable point where they will have less oil money. Um, but but when do you think that happens and how do you think they respond to it? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure yet. Um, I'm, I've been thinking about this for some time. Um, so, so here's what I know so far. Um, oil is going to oil consumption is going to keep growing for some time, right? The, but it's still it, only growing at like one or two percent a year, yeah, right? It's not I mean, going fast, and yeah. and the investment in in the, from oil companies has been going down and whatnot. So they see this coming, um, but but it's going to take some time. It's not going to be like in two, three, five years. It's, when it's when do you like, think it starts to? When do you think it starts to be at zero percent per year? And and at, 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 when, when do you think that hits? It's going it's going to start happening. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. My my get like fifty percent confidence is like ten ish years. Okay. Um, just because solar, like if I'm if you look at solar costs, yeah, um, I'm pretty convinced that they're going to more like your cars over time and your hybrid right. cars, it takes other sometimes, things. It takes yeah. Some time for the, exactly right. So so my guess is ten ish years. Um, but but then I think it's going to go real fast. It's going to take some time, and then it's going to go. Real and fast. then it's like two, three, four percent a year kind of type of thing decline. Uh, maybe um, this is not even if it declined one percent a year. Um, I mean, we're talking about massive, massive uh, uh, drops in price. So so I think like if uh, I think you're asking basically what's the shape of the curve? Yeah. Uh, and and so I think the shape of the curve is 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 been like this like this so far and then we're here and mm -hmm. then it's going to keep going a little up a little bit and then it's going to stabilize and then it's going to start going down down and then it's going to accelerate. And it's going to accelerate and it's going to go, go down fast at some point, right? Because and once so, it accelerates, I mean, we're going to see it's it's 10 dollars a barrel, right? Uh, right, you have yeah. all this supply coming in. You can remember, you can now pull methane from thin air, uh, solar costs are already cheaper, like for electricity, than than uh, than from oil, and it, they're going to get ten times cheaper. Right? Um, uh, this is going to push for other industries like heat pumps. Today, they are increasing very fast exponentially, but they're going to grow even faster because the differential in costs for heating is going to be a no-brainer. I'm going to yeah. go for electricity, so electricity uh, ele electrification is going to accelerate and accelerate. It's not going to go slowly. And so the curve of, of oil falling is going to be dramatic at some point. And we've seen this in history. Like you, you look at some transitions uh, in history, um, even like coal in the 1600s in, uh, in, uh, in England, 
replaced wood within 30 years, right? Uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, um, light bulbs replace um, the previous uh, technology like within 10 years. So it's really, really, these things can go really, really fast. And I think that's what, what's going to happen. And so what's going to happen is the countries that have had time to adapt to this upfront um, will um, be able to um, to survive. But it's like you have the innovator's dilemma here. It's so hard. And let's take an example of Saudi Arabia. So like um, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, MBS, is seeing this coming. That's why he's investing in the line, in, in, in all these things. That's mm-hmm. why he's allowing women to work and to drive and whatnot, because he sees the writing on the wall. But like, can you change a country's culture to become hyper-productive in 10 years when the entire country has been built for 80 years on the back of oil? I don't think that's the case. And so, and so, and so something really, really bad, I think, is going to happen in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And we can, ha- we can see some examples of other countries where something similar happened. So Nauru, for example, the island of Nauru in, in the Pacific, used to be one of the richest countries in the world because they were uh, exporting, I think, phosphorus. Um, and then uh, that phosphorus is not something that uh, returns. And so they finished mining it. There's no more phosphorus. And the country went to shit. And now the, the, one of the biggest sources of income is uh, immigration management for Australia. Uh, but it's extremely, extremely poor. It could not replace easily these natural resources. And I think that's going to happen to many of the oil producers today. If oil starts to become super cheap and energy changes, you would think this is also very good for like many Asian countries, good for India, good for China, good for Japan, good for South Korea, um, because they're all big like net importers of of oil today. Do you agree or? Yeah, I think it's 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 good for everybody in the long term, including the oil uh, countries. But in the short term, it's going to be very very bad for the oil countries, and it's going to be good for everybody else, right? So. Very good for sure for Asian countries. It's going to be good for Europe. It's going to be great for for um, for Africa and all the Middle East that doesn't have oil. So Pakistan today is is one of the countries that is electrifying and getting into solar um, electricity the fastest um, because oil is very expensive there and their grid is shit. And so and so they are becoming, you know, I'm going to be independent from the grid. I'm going to get solar energy. And now suddenly industries that were impossible before start becoming possible. So we're going to see this there. We're going to see this in Africa, in all of Africa. We're going to see this in, in Latin America. And it's always better when uh, resources are distributed because nobody then can control them and tax them and have a monopoly. Right. So overall, for, for the world and for humanity, this is amazing. Nobody will be able to control energy anymore. You know, um, internet adoption grew much faster than other technologies, even like the printing press or the radio. How are, you know, and we've got these new things like mobile, which is even growing even faster than internet. Um, what are some of the ramifications for other things, you know, the new kind of waves like AI? Yeah, I think, I think but we, we've talked about how like people don't fully understand how energy works and, and, and transportation, right? And the cost of transportation and, and information is another one, right? And, and it's useful, useful here to go back to history to understand what happened, how communication technologies shaped history. And the perfect one is the printing press. So, so before the printing press, uh, information mm, management throughout Europe was handled by the church. The, the Catholic church had a monopoly on information and information moved very slowly because it was as fast as the correspondence or as fast as scribes could write. And suddenly uh, you have the printing press, you, you, your marginal cost of producing um, uh, information, storing information and communicating information goes down dramatically. Um, and then uh, Immediately, scientific uh, discoveries shoot up. The other thing that you see is that politics comp- go completely reshaped. The, the Protestantism is impossible without the, um, the printing press. Uh, it's because uh, the church did not have a monopoly on information anymore that suddenly you can have um, people disagreeing with it and distributing this information. And so you have a dramatic 
um, a change in science, you have a dramatic change in politics. In the politics, so much so that the church's power starts dwindling and the nation states start emerging. Um, why? Because areas that um, like had big cities, they were the ones producing the most books and they produced, produced it in the local vernacular. And then the, uh, the people around these areas started learning this language to be able to read these books and communicate. And so what's happening is little by little, you get these islands of language that start expanding. Right? And so German starts appearing from this French, Italian, Spanish. And so you have these languages that eventually create nations that um, feel very nationalistic. That was impossible without the printing press. It's because the language became uh, discreet like this. So now fast forward to today. The internet is going is, is basically doing the exact same thing. Uh, it, it is changing how we produce information, how we're producing science, and how uh, our uh, politics are going to change. And so you mentioned AI and you, you mentioned mobile, and, and I think these are two examples of how this process is accelerating. Right? The internet took 30 years to to develop, and then mobile. Like within 10, 20 years, everybody is, is, has, a, has a mobile phone, and then AI is faster. Um, ChatGPT has one of the biggest, like fastest adoption rates in, in history. And so here we're at this cusp where these technologies are being adopted extremely fast and faster and faster and faster, but we haven't seen yet the scientific evolution and the political evolution that is about to, to, to come. And we're feeling it already because things like the woke movement and counter woke movement and things like this are the result of the internet, but we're living through it. So, so we're, we don't have the perspective to understand what's coming. And so the, cause there's been a lot of people have been saying science has not been progressing, you know, very fast, let's say since the seventies, it's really slowed down. So, you, you know, you have this rise of communication, the rise of globalization, the rise of people all over the world to communicate very, very, very quickly. You would think that would massively accelerate scientific discovery, scientific learning. What do you say to the skeptics that say yeah. science is not progressing as fast as it should? So a, a couple of thoughts on this. One of them is I, I read, I don't know, a dozen papers for each one of the articles that I write. So I, I read a lot of papers from a lot of fields. And I can tell you that papers that are older than five, six years, like there's, they're far and in between and they're much lower quality. And so like for my, my- Oh, so you're saying the more recent papers are significantly better than even more. papers that were six years ago. There's more quantity and there's more quality of them. Interesting, um, okay. Yeah, and so my uh, anecdotal evidence there is that I don't believe that science is is, is slowing down. Uh, I'll give you a couple more. Uh, a lot of the people who say that scientists science um, is slowing down is because they're saying, "Where are the geniuses?" Right, and, and I think that the, they look at, for example, literature and say, "Oh, yeah. the geniuses were four centuries ago. Where are the Shakespeare's of today?" Where is Mozart? Yeah. Where is That's right. yeah? That's right. Okay, go right. Einstein. Yeah, exactly. But if you think about it, this is not a problem of geniuses, it's a problem of fields. Is it a coincidence that Shakespeare and Cervantes appear soon after the printing press? It's not, because before that, like it was much harder to, to be mm -hmm. good at literature. And so literature was an emerging field. And all the innovation happens in the, in the emerging fields. Right. Yep. So obviously, if physics yeah, being is a uh, classical music composer today is not that uh, it's not right. it's not a new technology. It's not something like the, the the most ambitious people go do. That's right. And so and so, what you see is all of the innovation in any field is early on. Music is the is a good example. Physics, like right? there was an explosion in in physics development in the nineteenth century and twentieth century. Well, a lot of these things have already been discovered. So the low hanging fruits are taken. Yep. So if, you, if, you, if you take this perspective, then the question is completely different. Is, is okay, it's a question of innovation of fields. So the, the, the new question would be, okay, what's the equivalent of literature for today? And, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Video games have been um, evolving at a speed that is unbelievable over the, in the last few decades. Yep. And I'm sure in a, in a century, people are going to say, oh my God, the creator of Nintendo, the creator of The Last of Us, like these are amazing games. We don't have any creators like this. Yeah, yeah. OpenAI 
Transformers, AI, like, oh my God, these people are amazing. These creators, we don't have them anymore in AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, because AI is not. So, so for me, it's, it's more a question of fields. And I don't yeah. believe a second that science is, is slowing down. In fact, with AI, I'm pretty sure it's going to accelerate. It's interesting because like, you know, in the 80s, it's kind of like starting in the 70s, when, when people say scientific innovation went down um, in the 80s, like we saw so much innovation in finance. Um, you know, that, right. that really exploded and it was just like, well, it's kind of, maybe it's just the same person and they just decided to go, maybe that's not great for society. I don't know. You can make an argument that is, or it isn't great for society that all these smart people decided to go into finance, but that's where we saw just like ton of innovation. So I, I agree with you. And, and I, I don't think actually that's so bad. I think, I think what's happening is people are not stupid and they're, they're going uh, where there's the highest ROI in their efforts, right? So physics, when physics is lower ROI, they go to finance. And yeah. finance is actually an extremely useful field because it's the proper allocation of resources, right? So I'm so glad. But then, but then you, in the 2000s, after the crash, substantially fewer people go, were going there and they started going into, into tech and, uh, in, and the internet. And that's the right allocation of resources because that was a new field and yeah. everything was there to, dis to be discovered. And now they're going to AI. And so it's always, we're always doing this. So, so I'm not worried about the arc of, of innovation there in history. Interesting. And it, 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 do you think AI is going to be more than an internet level breakthrough? Like, are we, is, 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 it, is it even more profound? Okay, so so I'm going to spell this out, but the short is my P-Doom is 20%, and I think okay. we have 8 to 15 years to leave. So so what does it mean? P-Doom, right? So so um, how acquainted is your audience to this? Uh, fairly acquainted, yeah. Okay, good, right? So so uh, the, the idea that you create this AI, it studies itself to improve itself, and then because it's an AI, it does this faster and faster and faster. And so there's an extreme, like a foom, extremely fast takeoff in, in, in intelligence. And then they can become super intelligence uh, in, 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 in a matter of um, days or months, right? Um, and, and so I, I believe there's a high likelihood that this happens. And when you look at the market, like Metaculous and things like this, the predictions for this is between like seven and, and 15 years. Um, with a median around, I think, eight, right? So they're saying basically on by 2032, uh, we we end up uh, with uh, with super intelligence. And I don't know if it's 2032, but the, the decade is going to be the 2030s. So in the decade of the 2030s, if, if not early, uh, we are going to have super intelligences. And this is, we just don't know what's going to happen after this. This is what we're saying about singularity. We're calling this singularity. We just don't know. So the only thing that I know is that things are going to get accelerating faster and faster and faster. AI is the future, is the only thing that really matters right now. Unless there's some limitation, limiting factor that we don't know, that I'm not sure about, which might be energy or our ability to produce data centers and things like this. But even with that, I think it's probably going to come in, 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 in 8 to 15 years. And so we don't know what's going to happen after that. And this is the biggest, most important trend today. I mean, it's very, I think most people are both excited and incredibly worried and afraid at the same time. Um, and maybe more so than ever before. It's, you know, you have these kind of like dual things that are happening at once um, and, and certainly I'm both, I, I'm both very excited, f but also so scared that, um, not, not necessarily scared that the AI is going to paperclip maximize and, and, and eat me or something, but scared that humans won't be able to deal with it and we'll end up going to war or we'll end up like, you know, it, it just will accelerate, um, 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 the bad behavior as well. How, like where do you see a where, where where's the optimistic case that we can avoid some of these traps so I, I, one way to think about this is chimpanzees should not create homo sapiens right if they create homo sapiens they need to be damn sure that homo sapiens love them very very much yes uh, right, and so the the the, but the fact is, if Homo sapiens appear and they see that their um, the most intelligent alternative is chimpanzees, the very first thing that they're going to do is neutralize them. This is a fact, right? So unless we know to make them love us a lot, which we don't, mm -hmm. and we have seven to fifteen years to figure this out, 
we've been thinking about this for thousands of years. We haven't figured it out yet. We have seven to 15 years to figure this out. Um, and, and so I don't think we're, go we, we're going to make this um, happen in seven to 15 years. So that's why I'm very worried. Uh, 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 we are not ready to create, we, we are chimpanzees and we're not ready to create homo sapiens. So for me, the question is, like, should we delay this a little bit to figure it out? And because we only have one shot. So for sure, I would say we absolutely need to, to, to do this because they otherwise, we know they're going to be more intelligent than us. And so whatever they want to do, we are going to be the biggest ob obstacle. And so they, want to, they will want to neutralize us. Now, the question is, what does neutralizing us mean? I don't think they're going to kill us all because that's a waste of resources. Uh, but they could just disregard us depending on what they're yeah. trying to optimize. And that's very, very bad. And in this situation, the best case scenario is actually us being their pets. Yeah. Uh, there's actually not a better scenario than this. They're more intelligent than us. They can do whatever they want. Uh, uh, and so and so we become pets in 7 to 15 years, and that's the best case scenario. I, I agree with you that, that it would be great if we slowed down some of this um, AI kind of but but I don't see a way to do it because it's like you, you know it's like it's not like the there's some sort of global police force um to 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 slow it down and you know you can make okay well if China beats it, you know then they can have like a economic kind of um and and potentially military position over the US so is there is there any practical way to actually slow it down I think so and and if it's it's if you break this down right so so if you if you break the what you were just saying in more specifics there's just two countries who can who, who are going to be at the edge it's the United States and it's China there's no more um well and, but if they slow it down there's many many other countries that have the opportunities to to is it realistic to think that all the researchers that are in the bay area doing ai are going to move in lockstep to Uganda to do this? It's not going to happen. Uh, I, I, gonna well, happen. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I agree it would slow things down if the U.S. and China kind of got together somehow. But uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, and maybe it slows it down a, a bit. But uh, I, I, I imagine there'll be other places where it does kind of accelerate. So the AI researchers are based in the United States and China, and they're not as mobile as we might fear. And so that's great because it changes the coordination issue from one of coordinating 196 countries, which is nearly impossible, to coordinating two. Now, China coordinating, coordinating China and the United States is not easy, but... Even coordinating the United States is not that's easy. Right, that's right. Yeah. But... Um, I am much more hopeful because Xi Jinping in China is worried about this based on what we know. And so- I And they're behind the US, which makes it a little bit easier, behind. you know, because they, they might right. not want accelerating too fast because it's, it's likely it's the US that's going to accelerate there if it's exponential. And and, and there's, there's two or three fundamental reasons why China is going to be uh, slower. One of them is um, their science is mired with many more- problems of um, uh, bad quality, like science and like numbers that are fudged and things like this. That's one problem. Another problem is that uh, the tokenization actually is harder because of uh, all the characters that they have. Um, that's what I heard. And then the third one, I think that's the most important one, is that they force the models to be less truthful because of the authoritarian regime that they are that they have and so and that just strictly reduces the quality so so yeah. they have these forces behind like against them plus the fact that i think they're sensitive to the ai uh, uh doom possibility and so and so i think there is a possibility that coordination happens between the united states and china now i am not a fan of, of regulation i want to deregulate many many things many different industries but we only have one shot at getting this one right. And so the, if, the, if the question is, should we postpone heaven by 10 years or should we unleash hell right now? I think, I think it's like the, the, the answer is, is very obvious. Uh, a few years can give you so much more confidence that I think we need to regulate. Interesting. 
Now, you're, I know you're also a student of history. You and I have had many conversations in the past about um, historical things. W- what is an underrated war you think is was a kind of a turning point in history? Oh, oh so super exciting. Um, the 1870 war between France and Germany. Okay. So here's what happens, right? <clears throat> France was the biggest superpower in Europe for 150, 200 years. And then suddenly in 1870, Germany um, is like reaches Paris, like wins the war against Paris, and is founded actually in Paris. Like the foundation of Germany is in Versailles. And so what happened there? Um, France was the European superpower because it had by far the biggest population. Uh, it's one of the biggest countries. It's extremely fertile. So its population was extremely high. Then in the middle of the seven, 1700s, there's one idea that starts pervading France, and that's secularism, right? So the the, the church uh, was very strong everywhere, including France, but because of secularization in the 1700s, suddenly fertility starts going down in France, 100 to 150 years before anywhere else in Europe, Right. And if we go back to the printing press, that's one of the reasons. You cannot have a secularization without the printing press. But anyway, it starts in France. And you see the places that became more secular um, suddenly lose fertility the fastest. By the early 1800s, when Napoleon is crushing the rest of Europe, it's crushing the, he's crushing the rest of Europe because he has a very high, big population. That's the one, one of the biggest reasons. Also because he could recruit most of them thanks to nationalism ideas, right? So yeah. many, popul- many people and nationalism ideas, that means lots of soldiers. And that's the biggest reason why he wins. Not because he's a, an amazing a military leader, which he is, but because he has more people. And so, and so but, but, but by that time, Napoleon and company in France, they already were extremely worried about the fertility rate in France, which had gone down because of secularization. They were worried to death. By the 1870, in the year 1870 is the year when the German population equals the French population because they kept growing, whereas France yep. was not growing as much. And Germany unified. So now That's right. you have like many different countries coming together as one. That's right. Right. So suddenly the population of the Holy Roman Empire basically coalesces into Germany, that that population is bigger than the one in France. And that moment is the moment when Germany uh, starts winning. And yeah. and then after that, they- and, and you had to governance things too. Like Bismarck was, you know, clearly kind of the titan of that era. He was, but, but again, like this is an interesting factor. Um, the foundation of Germany follows um, the Germanization. Right? Yeah, so okay. it, it is like it, many countries are different where you, you have a polity that forms and then the, the, the language coalesces around it. In the case of Germany, it was the other way around. German w- uh, had been expanding um, and, and basically the Germany that Bismarck creates is wherever Germans were a majority, that was Germany, except for mm-hmm. Aust- um, Austria, right? That's basically it. So... Um, and, and remember that in the 19th century is the is the century where nationalism becomes a huge trend everywhere in Europe, mainly because every everybody was following the example of Napoleon. Napoleon, massive nation, nationalism in France. They saw that you can recruit all these soldiers for this with, with this idea. So everybody wanted wanted to be uh, nationalists. So so there's you have this big push for nationalism in Germany that happens in the 19th century that coalesces. Uh, the country and now, of course, Bismarck was very strong, and he did uh, things correctly. But all the elements in history were there, and that is the moment when, um, then, a few years later, Germany was a superpower in the in World War One and started winning. And if they didn't have the rest of the world against them, they would have won. And the same thing happened in World War Two. Uh, even to this day, the population in Germany is, I don't know, like 20, 30% bigger in France when it's like 20 to 30% smaller in surface. And that's because of that fertility rate change that came from secularization. And so I think for me- And just matters, hit, the secularization hit Germany later than it hit France. 
you know, like like a century and a half, I think, later or something like this. Oh wow! Like, okay. Yeah. So so you can see in around 1750 is when it starts hitting France heavily. I don't remember in Germany, but in the UK is I think in the 1880s. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, so 130 years later, um, and it's one of the reasons why why the UK actually became so powerful. It's not just um, Industrial Re Revolution, because actually the Industrial Revolution was starting in the Netherlands before. A big chunk of this is because also the population was growing substantially faster than the one in France. And so that's why I, I love this word like, so much, is because it's, it's showing these underlying patterns where fertility is one of the biggest drivers of success in wars in the past, when it's not something that we're considering. And this is very relevant today, because we have fertility crashing throughout the world. And we and a lot of people have kind of talked about this kind of like 1870 to 1945 is just like one big war um, that just went on for a very long time with many different maybe different many different governments in Germany, but just like one one like very kind of very long war. How do you think about that time? Yeah, uh, when when these big trends rearrange humans take some time to figure them out, right? And so France had been, had been the superpower for, for a long time. And that's what caused Napoleon. And Napoleon was overly ambitious, but if he hadn't been overly ambitious, he could have created a France that was substantially bigger than France is today. But what happens is like the, the, this invasion of Napoleon is basically World War I or two at the European level. Like mm -hmm. massive destruction, massive change in ideas across the, uh, across the, uh, the continent suddenly ideas of democracy and republics like start spreading everywhere. Monarchies start falling down. Nationalism starts going up. Right, and so for seventy years there's no more wars. Or sixty years there's barely any war in Europe because they're trying to figure out all of this and containing France. But the trends that were underlying them were growing. Nationalism was growing. Uh, fertility uh, was changing power, and so and so from the 1870s to 1945 you have now these big trends like clashing with reality to figure out a new world order. And I think there's a couple of things that happen there. One of them is um, Europeans and people in general across the world, but especially Europeans, start becoming so scared of these military power that they say, you know what, we're going to do whatever it takes to not do anything, uh, to, to not make this happen again. And so that's why you have the European Union. But also we're seeing these to this day in another aspect, which is Europeans are extremely worried about uh, using too much military power against Russia, right? They're, they're very reluctant to helping their neighbor uh, who needs, who, like they are the, the, the shield of Europe against Russia, and yet they're not supporting them. And I think that coming, is coming from these, these mindsets in World War I and World War II, where we were so horrified of what happened that we want, don't want to do it again. Um, and this attitude is only going to change when we get a slap of reality in the face. Interesting. The, um, and, and when we think about these detailed population, I mean, we're, we're at, at a point, I think the fertility rate in, in South Korea is like 0 0.7. Um, you know, Japan's not even a low fertility country anymore. It's like a mid fertility country because I think they're at one point three. They're doing better than most people. People always talk about Japan; they're actually doing better than I think yeah. Japan's doing better than Italy now or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so we're kind of like all kind of moving there outside of like Israel and a couple of other countries. Just at almost every country is just seeing this like massive decline. Um, and is is uh, like how does that kind of like reshape the world? Yeah. So I, I wrote about fertility, but it's a topic that I haven't touched for a long time because I don't think things are as clear cut as possible as, 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 as we think. And I'll tell you why. First is we have no clue where for, why fertility is going down as much. Yep. There is 50 culprits, right? The normal story is... Uh, oh, it's with economic development, there's more opportunities and people don't want to uh, have uh, more children because they want to invest more on, on them. But if this had been the case, then the UK would, would have dropped fertility much faster than France. 
Yeah, and um, you know, yeah. North Korea has dropped fertility, and you know, even these like ter- you know countries of really bad economic development. That's right. That's right. So, so it's, it is not that, uh, and sanitation is 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 one factor too, but it's probably not this. And there's and if you if you start going down, like there's a hundred of these, right? Is yeah. it because um, marriage is going down? Is it because urbanization? Is it because apartments are smaller? Is it because of status seeking behavior? Like there's a hundred of these potential reasons. And until this is properly diagnosed, we just don't know. And if we don't know, we can- And it might be it. each one could be 1% of it or something like that, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and But the interesting thing is it's going down everywhere in the world. So yeah. it, it cannot be a very complex thing. And it has to be something that happens that's happening everywhere uh, um, in the, in, with delays in time, but it's happening everywhere, right? So it has to be something relatively simple, uh, because otherwise, like, it would be different in different places. So, 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 so that's I think the, the one of the core issues with fertility. The other thing is, um, I would not be surprised if in the next few decades many of the fertility issues are resolved um, by themselves. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one of them is well, we talked about it, AI. Well. Once we reach singularity, who cares? Another example is longevity. Yeah, in like some ways, if, like if if you think of um, if if you think of like uh, uh, somebody with a soul that is intelligent, well, right. we could have um, every, you know, for every human, you could have thirty different you know AI agents that are that's essentially right. you know that's they right. might not have physical bodies, but they're essentially act as humans. That's right. So so that's one do, one way to solve it. Another one is with longevity, right? If we yeah. if we can postpone death for a long time, then we don't have a problem of underpopulation, but we have one of overpopulation. Another example is we're about to figure out how to use um, standard cells to get them into into gametes, so we can create um, IVF in vitro fertilization with any types of, of cell. You combine that with artificial wombs, and then suddenly yep. you can have babies uh, as many as, as you want by in eliminating two of the biggest uh, uh, drawbacks, which are um, like getting pregnant uh, and then and then the pregnancy itself. I'll give you another example. One of the biggest obstacles in, or two of the biggest obstacles for having children might be childcare and education or the cars, like there's no not enough car seats. But if suddenly energy goes down, uh, the cost of energy goes down and self-driving cars, can you drive you everywhere? Now you don't have a problem with the cars. And AI we have an AI and, teacher and, right. you know, yeah. Exactly. So, so my guess is there's so many variables on the fertility issue that although if things keep kept going this way, I would be very worried. But I think there's so many variables that are going to change in the next decades that I'm not worried about it right now. Yeah, you could definitely see a scenario where where like it it flips, right? There's a lot of scenarios where all of a sudden it flips and we see this kind of explosion in babies right. and stuff. That's right. So if, if this was a problem like that's going to hit us in two years, I would be extremely worried because it's something that's going to happen like hit us in like 50 years or whatnot. Like I'm not. Now, you also have written a lot about real estate, which has been kind of a cornerstone of wealth building, especially for Americans. Um, why don't you think it'll be a good investment going forward? Yeah. The biggest drivers of real estate price growth are not going to be true in the future, right? The reasons why your your house has in price has gone, been going up up till now is not going to be true anymore. So if you break this down... Uh, what are the big drivers of of uh, of um, how population in, growth? I presume of, is, that's right. is so very important. Is, is, is the, the, exactly the biggest one is is supply of land actually versus demand of land, and the biggest driver of the of the of the um, uh, supply of demand is number of people. And the population mm-hmm. has been growing since the fifties. Like the, like there's no tomorrow. It's not just the the population though. It's also the household size, right? So. Uh, households were much bigger and now you have fewer people per household and so if you have 10 times more people but also you each household is smaller then you you have like right in the u.s times. it used to be like the average home was like 800 square feet um that was like in the 50s it was 800 right. square feet now we're you know it's 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 much approaching bigger. like 3,000 square exactly. feet it's just so much bigger it's like 5x bigger than it used to be Exactly. And so the demand has been growing and growing and growing like crazy over the last eight decades, uh, seven, seven, seven decades. Um, conversely, uh, the supply uh, has been reasonably constrained. It was completely unbridled in the middle of the 20th century. 
um, when cars had been invented and then people mm-hmm. were going to the suburbs and whatnot. So supply was umbre- 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 town, you know, growing and those types of things. So. That's right. That's right. But that is not true anymore for the last like three, four decades. Right. And so uh, uh, there's the NIMBY movement and all those things. Mm-hmm. And so what, what happened over the last four or five decades is that you had a constraint in the supply, whereas your demand was growing like crazy. And so that's why prices have been going up. <laughs> These trends have lasted so long that all the people who experienced real estate before are dead. So uh-huh. all the people who remember real estate have lived this. And so they think this is all of history. But that's not what happened. Up till the 1950s, actually, the price of real estate was extremely stable. Throughout yeah, the even houses like up till the 70s really didn't go up very much at all. Ah, yeah. So depending on the place, but that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So the supply is really limited starting in the 80s. Um, and so, and so, what happens in the future is the demand is actually not going to grow because the population is not going to grow. Uh, your household size is not shrinking anymore. Um, and uh, the only um, driver of demand going up is more square feet per person. But because, mm-hmm. again, your, your number of people per household has been At some point, out. we've reached, like, you just can't get any bigger. Like, like right. you go to, right. so, I go to, sometimes I go to a friend of mine's house and they're like 15,000 square feet and they've got two kids. Like, they don't even know where their kids are. That's right. So I, I mean, if, when you look at the data, it, it does look like it's it's still growing per person, like the, yeah. the square footage. But I, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. And so if the population is 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 shrinking, and uh, the household size is not going down anymore, and the, then the biggest drivers of demand are changing from going up to going down. And then well, and the so then we look like Japan, where real estate's been basically flat. That's right. That's right. So I think if you like the uh, if you if the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, right? Uh, um, and Japan is the future in this. Uh, and so you can just see what's happening in Japan, and that's going to happen everywhere. But not just Japan. Like You can also see places like Detroit and things like this. where where And, and, and I think that's more like what's happening. Yeah, and mm-hmm. J- Detroit house, housing is almost free. Um, they'll basically right. like give you a house if you promise to live there, right? That's right. That's right. And so in, 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 a, in a case like Japan, for example, uh, the price of real estate has been going down everywhere but in Tokyo, right? Because people will yeah. always want to go to the biggest like network FX place, and that's Tokyo with the most population. And so what's going, what I think is going to happen is the places that have the most network effects, probably like New York uh, um, and places like this, might keep um, getting more demand. And so the prices might not uh, go down, but the prices in, in mid-tier countries are, are, are going to plummet. And so countries like, like cities like Detroit, I think are much more likely in the future than in the past. Interesting. Two more questions we ask yeah. all of our guests. Uh, what is a conspiracy theory that you believe? I didn't prepare this one. Uh, what is a conspiracy theory that I believe in? Oh, yeah. So um, from COVID, uh, I realized that governments are really bad at management. And so as a result, I don't believe in that many conspiracy theories because usually conspiracy theories mean uh, lots of people are um, um, with a lot of power are hiding and they're controlling the world. And I don't think that happens. I think it's just like poor management. Um, so as a result, I, I don't th- I don't believe in many conspiracy theories. Uh, but from COVID, I also looked into a lot of these things, and I think it's very likely that COVID was started in the lab in Wuhan. Um, like it's just yeah, I don't even know that's a conspiracy theory anymore. Yeah, exactly. It seems like it's like it's kind of like moved to to uh, general acceptance. You're right, uh, but but I also give you the reason why. Uh, I, I don't believe in, in, in many of them is because Jesus, like people, like governments are so bad at management uh, that I, I, I don't think there's, there's many. But I'll think about it. Okay, interesting. Our right, last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice do you think is generally bad advice? I think right now, 
8% on of advice on career management is wrong um, because nearly everybody gives advice based on their experience and everybody's experience is about to be appended yep. so nobody's experience is relevant and so i think the only relevant um, advice uh, with regards to career management is get on ai figure out how it works and learn to learn fast because whatever it is that you're doing is going to be worthless in a few years and just to illustrate this I have invested tons in my education. I have graduate degrees and things like that. I don't really care about my the formal education of my children. I think it's going to be worthless. Um, and I'm focused much more on making them grow to be uh, happy and curious and, and learn fast than about anything they learn in school. I mean, if we're all going to be pets, shouldn't we just like all just try to get cuter? <laughs> I always say please and thank you to Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Tomas uh, Poyo, for joining us on World of Das. I follow you at Tomas uh, Tomas Poyo on X. I definitely encourage our listeners to engage with you there. This has been super interesting, very wide ranging, and, and a ton of fun. I love it. I, I love talking with you. I think you really get uh, where I'm going with my my, my content, uh, so it's a pleasure talking with you. And if you're a super data nerd, go to worldofdas.com. That's D-A-A-S, worldofdas.com, and sign up for our weekly Data as a Service News Roundup newsletter. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, consider rating this podcast and leaving a review. For more World of Das, and Das is D-A-A-S, you can subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts. And also check out YouTube for videos. You can find me at Twitter at at Oren, that's A-U-R-E-N, Oren, and we'd love to hear from you.